Hi, I'm WTOP film critic Jason Fraley, and for the entire month of August, we're ranking the best movies in every genre. 30 genres for 30 days. And today we're breaking down the best family dramas. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why separate it out into family comedies, which we talked about yesterday, and family dramas, which we talked about today? Why not just family? Well, I mean, yes, while you'll see that on IMDb or in the old days on Blockbuster, it would just say family. When I looked at all these, just to say, when I looked at some of the dramas I'm going to put on here, like, you know, American Beauty, um, it's weird to call that a family flick. You know, I, you know, that's why I separated it, because when you think family, you think something you can sit and watch with the family. So that's more of your family comedies. Here is where I wanted the ones, and again, just to get 25 more of my favorite movies on here, um, we put some family dramas, which includes movies like um, uh, The Grapes of Wrath. You have the Jodes going across country in the Depression, um, and Henry Fonda holding them together. Along similar lines, Dee Reese's Mudbound. I know it's a new movie, but it's these two families and a great cast um, growing up um, in the 40s South in Mississippi. Um, we also get The Color Purple, which, again, you could have put in drama um, or maybe even epics, but I put it here because there's that there's those family dynamics, um, the, the, the conflicts there going on with um, Whoopi Goldberg and Danny Glover, and then Oprah comes in, too. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I, you could say Color Purple is in here, too. Uh, the Tree of Life might sound weird here because, um, of course, it juxtaposes uh, the formation of the universe with those like that like half-hour sequence of lava and chemicals, and then it shows dinosaurs evolve. I mean, it basically goes from Big Bang to now, but it intercuts it um, with a suburban family drama with Brad Pitt and Jessica Chastain raising their kid. Um, so just because Terrence Malick had the guts to intercut uh, the family drama stuff with the formation of mankind doesn't really make it less of a family drama. If anything, it makes it, um, well, you might say pretentious. Uh, Ken says uh, genius. I come down somewhere a little more in between. Um, it is definitely a little indulgent, but I thought it stuck with me. It's one of my favorite Maliks. Um, we also get really heavy hit family dramas like Manchester by the Sea, um, Table Casey Affleck's uh, accusations. I, honestly, I think if all that news came out before the Oscars, he wouldn't have won it. All the Me Too stuff broke afterwards. Uh, a little unfortunate. Um, but, um, you know, someone else probably, Denzel probably would have won for Fences. Um, but instead, um, you know, it's still, we can't take away the other great, we need a Kenneth Lonergan on this list. He's one of the great filmmakers now. And, uh, you know, Manchester by the Sea was really heavy. I snuck that in the last slide because of the Affleck stuff, but I wanted to get Lonergan on here. Um, we also get uh, movies like On Golden Pond, which was Henry Fonda. Uh, he wins an Oscar is in his last role. He and Catherine Hepburn, you know, towards the end of their careers, they'd had such great careers. Hepburn had won a bunch. He's, she's the only, she has four Oscars. But Fonda had never won. And, uh, and in this, he's sort of a crotchety older man, you know, fishing out by the cabin on their lake on Golden Pond, um, uh, meeting, you know, bonding with the young boy. Um, but to me, the real drama here is his, he and his real life daughter, Jane Fonda, who didn't get along in real life at all. Um, they came together in this movie, and some of their screen, some of their scenes where F Jane Fonda is saying like, "Why couldn't we have a relation like this before, Dad?" Um, you see, there's a brief moment where Fonda kind of lowers his head and, and cries and says his line, and. That's real stuff, folks. Um, and then along similar lines, Amour. You know, we have the, the golden years of Hepburn and Fonda and On Golden Pond, but Amour, uh, the French film about, you know, basically it, it, it's really heavy stuff. Uh, Michael Haneke, uh, one of his better movies. Um, I think, uh, and won the Oscar for Best Foreign Flick, but, and I think, believe the Palme d'Or too, it can. Um, but to me, yes, it's heavy, but it's an important reminder of the whole, um, to death do his part, in sickness and in health. And this one shows the end sickness, those final days. Uh, with the love of your life. Amor, check it out. Now, a whole other subsection of the family drama category was I reserved for the, the marital conflicts, all these marriage battles. There's been a lot of good movies about that. That They're hard to watch, but important. Um, and when you think of divorces and, and relationships coming apart, uh, you, you kind of think here. So that gives us movies like Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Uh, the great El Edward Albee play adapt adapted by Mike Nichols in his directorial debut. Um, Liz Taylor and Richard Burton, who of course were real lovers off screen, Go at it here. The, actually, they say Total War. Um, with some interesting, uh, if you've never seen the play, which I love, and one of my favorite plays, but if you've never seen it, some interesting surprises up its sleeve um, in terms of plot twists at the end. Virginia Woolf is great. Um, but you also get movies like A Streetcar Named Desire. Um, so the, the marriage uh, conflict there with, with Stanley Kowalski and how he blows up that, that marriage. Um, scenes from a marriage, the Ingmar Bergman movie, um, which I, I know was also a TV movie, but it was re released theatrically um, as well, like a year before or after. So we included that. Um, a Woman Under the Influence, the best of the John Cassavetes movies. Um, again, they're not for everybody. They're super indie. I mean, he was like the 
the indie filmmaking pioneer. But this movie, I think, is his best. I mean, yeah, I like Faces, too, but I think um, A Woman Under the Influence is his best, mostly because you get Gina Rowland's um, in awesome performance. I mean, a lot of the the um, the mental instability stuff that Kate Blanchett won the Oscar for Blue Jasmine late years, decades later, I think was first done here with Gina Rollins in A Woman Under the Influence, just easily one of the most powerful performances ever put on screen. That has to go in here in the family dramas under this marital conflict er, uh, subsection. Also, Breaking the Waves, uh, the Lars von Trier movie, um, A Separation, the Asghar Farhadi from Iran. Um, we wanted to get uh, the Middle East on here as well, so we have that movie. If you haven't seen A Separation, it, <laughs> go see it. It's so great. It's one of the greatest looks um, at, well, a separation. Uh, so that's in here with the marital conflicts as well. Now, of all those great, really heavy movies we've mentioned in this category, I mean, of all of them, this is probably the hardest, one of the hardest to, to, to watch in terms of the sit because, oh, you just see these couples and these families go at it, and it's really hard, but that's, hey, we're talking family drama, so let's get on with the drama. The top three. I went number three, Ordinary People. Um, Robert Redford just recently re announced uh, his retirement. Um, but this was the moment that he went from a, a really iconic on-screen actor to behind the lens. Uh, he, this was his directorial debut, um, and what a debut it was. Um, he cast Mary Tyler Moore, um, totally against type. You know, she was beloved and, and on, on TV in her TV show in the sitcom, but here all of a sudden she switches and, oh my God, one of the most stressful, controlling moms ever. You almost feel bad for Donald Sutherland in this. Um, a lot of the, you know, the, the son, the, bo the parents are, a lot of the conflict is that they're grieving uh, the drowning of their one son their favorite son and the other son that's left over has to go to therapy um, which if you look at those scenes a lot of those influence the the, the goodwill hunting um, therapy scenes uh, for the for Matt Damon and, and Robin Williams so ordinary people is great I personally yes it won best picture and director I personally think that um, that that was a crazy upset because I think uh, Martin Scorsese should have easily won at least director uh, I should, best picture too uh, for uh, Raging Bull that year um, but you know, uh, Raging Bull was a little, <laughs> he's a little more arty and a little uh, more daring and depressing. Um, so Ordinary People, um, I guess it was a little bit safer choice, but I don't want to take anything away from it. It's one of the best scripts ever. Um, check it out. I think it gets a bad rap because um, it beat uh, Raging Bull. It's always on those lists, similar to Shakespeare in Love, beating Private Ryan. It's always on those lists of how dare it won, and, but it's still a really good movie. Check out Ordinary People. Um, number two on this list of family dramas, um, a movie that's very similar or, or, to Ordinary People in terms of showing um, the white, the, the underbelly of the white picket fence. Uh, everything, you think the suburbia is all great, but there's so much drama going on behind the scenes. Um, and a movie I think is actually better, better done, uh, it's definitely more risque, is American Beauty. Um, a tough, tough pick, obviously, because of the revelations with with Kevin Spacey, um, it's tricky. We had the same thing with the usual suspects on the mystery list or, um, or seven. Um, ultimately, I, I put these movies on the list because, um, you know, unlike, you know, an author or even a musician, um, I think film is such a collaborative medium that it just felt, it felt wrong to take away from Sam Mendes in his directorial debut, winning all those Oscars. Um, Ball's script is one of the greatest, I think, coolest scripts ever. Um, and it, it, it kind of it opens with you know the the late the with Spacey narrating from beyond the grave, similar to uh, Sunset Boulevard, um, but just the way that Mendez directs it with the, the, the red flowers always being a symbolic image. I mean, look, right before, uh, well, no spoiler alert, but there's red flowers on the table there. Of course, there's those red petals when Spacey's having his uh, fetishes. So in a weird way, um, yeah, you know what? Even after Spacey's revelations, we get to see, we kind of get to see some of those um, weird um, underage fetishes here. So, I mean, that if that part makes you uncomfortable, it makes me uncomfortable. I can't really look at that movie. Same with, like, all the Weinstein-produced movies. I can't really look at them the same anymore. Honestly, I think I would have put it number one if not for that, but I drop it a slot here. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it could go either way. I wouldn't fault you if you wanted to keep it off your list, but again, it's the collaborative thing. It's the director. It's the screenwriter. The cinematographer is some of the coolest cinematography ever. The music as that bag's floating through the air, that piano theme. And, of course, Annette Benning. Come on. Probably her best role. One of the greatest actresses ever. So I didn't want to punish them, but I did drop it to two because of that stuff. Um, and then number one. Uh, you might call it a swerve, but uh, trying to go uh, against the grain. But uh, honestly, if you've seen it, if, oh, it just it wrecked me, and it's and it's in a subtle way too. Tokyo Story, um, Ozu's Japanese classic. 
Um, again, uh, get yourself in the right mindset. It's not flashy like, uh, I don't know, Tarantino at all. No, it's, um, or even American Beauty on this list. It's more patient. The Ozu always, sh at least especially in this movie, he shot with the camera low to the ground because, you know, culturally they're sitting on the floor a lot. Um, and it's these static shots. Jarmusch uh, in Stranger Than Paradise, a lot of his movies borrowed that directly. A lot of those static uh, floor level shots of these this family. But why I wanted to put it number one is, to me, it's the one movie that when I saw it, um, I mean, Lady Bird did the same thing, but this too, I wanted to call my parents afterwards and, and grandparents too, um, and just spend more time with them because literally the whole whole purpose of this is it's these aging parents um, who, are, or, who are now grandparents in Japan. Um, they're so excited because their grown, grown, you know, their kids uh, are, who are now grown ups um, are coming to visit. Um, they've taken a, a couple hour train ride. They're coming. They're so excited. And then when they're there for the week long vacation, they, they, they're too busy for them. They're, they're off sightseeing and catching up with other friends and doing all this stuff. And you just feel so bad for the, the grandparents. Um, and it makes you, it made me pause and think, uh, it, wow, I need to spend more time with mine um, because literally you never know when, when their last day is. So for that power, not to mention just the important, you know, this is 1953, um, Ozu's place in, in Japanese cinema. I mean, I put them up with, you know, Kurosawa and Mitsuguchi and all those guys, but this is the masterpiece. And so call it a, a, a outside the box pick, but if you really watch it and think about how poetic and kind of graceful and simple too, um, but important in terms of how it'll inspire you to interact with your own family, Tokyo Story, my number one family drama. See the full top 25 family dramas on WTOP.com's entertainment page. Join the blog and tell us what you think. And then tune in tomorrow as we break down my top 25 fantasies of all time.